The story of Joan of Arc, a peasant girl from medieval France, has intrigued scholars and historians for centuries. Her remarkable journey, marked by visions, military leadership, and eventual martyrdom, raises questions about the nature of her experiences. Was she a madwoman, plagued by mental illness, or a holy warrior, chosen by divine forces to fulfill a higher purpose? This is her story. Joan of Arc was born around the year 1412 in a quaint village in the northeastern region of France. The exact date of her birth remains a mystery, and her own statements about her age were often ambiguous. Her father earned his livelihood as a peasant farmer, cultivating a modest plot of land. In addition to his farming duties, he contributed to the family income by serving as a village official. Joan of Arc entered the world amidst the turbulent backdrop of the Hundred Years' War, a long-standing conflict between England and France that had erupted in the year 1337. The war was ignited by disputes over English territories in France and contested claims to the French throne. The battleground was primarily in France, leading to severe economic devastation in the country. During Joan's birth, France itself was in a state of political disarray. King Charles VI of France, nicknamed Charles the Mad, grappled with recurrent episodes of mental illness, rendering him frequently incapable of effective rule. His incapacity further deepened the political divisions within the kingdom. The internal political infighting within France was rife. There were rumours that Charles VII was not Charles the Mad's son, but the offspring of an adulterous affair between Isabeau, Charles the Mad's wife, and the assassinated Duke of Orleans. Charles the Mad would make an agreement with King Henry V of England, that upon his death, the English heirs would become the kings of France. King Henry V died in August, in the year 1422, leaving his young son, who became King Henry VI of England. Charles the Mad died two weeks after King Henry, making little Henry the King of France as well. The son disinherited by Charles the Mad, known as Dauphin Charles, continued to fight to regain his kingdom. According to legend during Joan's youth, a prophecy circulating in the French countryside promised an armed virgin would come forth to save France. Another prophecy, attributed to Merlin, stated that a virgin carrying a banner would put an end to France's suffering. Divine revelations came to her in the ethereal voices of Saint Michael, Saint Catherine, and Saint Margaret. It was in the midst of her humble gardening chores that the first divine whisper reached her ears, accompanied by a radiant blaze of light, emanating from the voice of Saint Michael. In the days that followed, the celestial voices of Saint Catherine and Saint Margaret graced her senses, Embracing these extraordinary visions, Joan made a profound decision to dedicate her entire life to God, vowing celibacy and devoting herself to his divine purpose. Over the span of two years, the visits from these holy figures grew in intensity and frequency. Through these divine encounters, Joan came to understand her sacred mission to liberate France from the clutches of the English and ensure the rightful king's coronation upon the French throne. Around the age of 16 or 17, the heavenly voices imparted explicit instructions. Joan was directed to journey to the nearby town of Vacouleur and meet with the garrison commander. She was to persuade him that she had been chosen to lead the Dauphin to his rightful crowning the garrison commander was sceptical, and he initially scoffed at her claims and advised her to return home. Undeterred, 
Joan boldly foretold a dire French defeat, specifically mentioning the impending loss at the Battle of the Herrings. Tragically, her prophecy came true, casting a shadow of despair not only over the people of Orleans, but also over the entire French military. Confronted with the grim reality of France's desperate situation, the commander relented. He granted Joan an escort of six soldiers, allowing her the opportunity to present her case directly to the heir to the throne, Charles VII. After a brief wait of two days, Charles the Dauphin consented to meet with Joan. Curious, and perhaps a bit sceptical, he had donned a disguise in an attempt to test her authenticity. To his astonishment, Joan immediately recognised him, proving her extraordinary perception. Convinced of the sincerity of her mission, Charles was prepared to deploy her to the troops. However, his advisers, still harbouring doubts, demanded further evidence to dispel their scepticism. Joan underwent a rigorous examination over the course of three weeks, probing her visions and intentions thoroughly, seeking any hint of deception. After extensive scrutiny, learned scholars became convinced of the genuineness and righteousness of Joan's divine revelations. They also verified her virginity. This was to establish if she could indeed be the prophesied virgin saviour of France. Persuaded by the scholar's expert judgement, they advised Charles that Joan would be a valuable asset. Despite her lack of military experience, Joan was entrusted with a modest force of soldiers, marking the beginning of her journey as a military leader. Charles would even commission plate armour to be made for her, completely transforming her from the daughter of a peasant farmer to a fully armoured warrior prepared for battle. She even designed her own banner and would carry it into war. Upon aligning herself with the Dauphin's cause, Joan's presence had a profound effect on the spirits of those around her. Her charismatic personality ignited a spark of hope among the troops, instilling in them a newfound sense of devotion and in the belief of divine intervention. Prior to embarking on her journey to Orleans, Joan composed a letter addressed to the Duke of Bedford. She boldly warned him, asserting her divine mandate from God to expel him from the land of France. In the last week of April of the year 1429, Joan was sent as part of a relief force to help the French in Orleans. She quickly found a way into the city and was greeted enthusiastically. She was not given any formal command or included in military councils, but quickly gained the support of her troops. She always seemed to be present where the fighting was most intense, and she frequently stayed within the front ranks, giving the warriors a sense that she was fighting for their salvation. Joan would urge her commanders to attack the English temporary wooden fort that they had been using to besiege the city. However, she would step on a metal spike and would later go back to the city to recover. The next morning, Joan would go onto the battlefield holding her banner, raising the morale of the troops. But she was struck down while standing in a trench by a longbowman. The arrow struck her between the neck and the left shoulder. Rumours of her death bolstered the English defenders and faltered French morale, but according to eyewitnesses, she later returned during the evening and told the soldiers that a final assault would result in victory, which is what occurred. The French forced the English out of Orleans and took their fortress of Tourelle. The French people thought Joan had been sent by God. In contrast, the English saw the ability of this peasant girl to defeat their armies as proof she was possessed by the devil. After the destruction of the English army, Joan insisted that Charles be crowned, and on the 16th of July, 
in the year 1429. Charles ascended to the throne. Paris, however, was still in control of the English. Joan and her forces would make for the city. Joan of Arc fearlessly led the French army in a determined charge towards the main gate of the city. With unwavering resolve, she sought to breach the city's water-filled moat that lay before the gate. Despite their valiant efforts, the French forces were unable to capture any part of the gatehouse or its protective walls, facing devastating losses in the process. Joan was also struck by a crossbow bolt, injuring her thigh severely. In the midst of the chaos, she was pulled away from the battlefield, marking a temporary halt to her assault. Although she wished to resume the attack on Paris, Charles ordered her to withdraw to the Abbey of Saint Denis. After a few hours of assaulting the walls of Paris, Charles sounded the retreat as no progress had been made. The city would remain under English control. After the defeat of Paris, Joan's role in the French court diminished and the court no longer had faith in her. Charles would negotiate a four-month truce with the Burgundians. During this time, the Duke of Burgundy would begin to reclaim towns which had been ceded to him by the treaty. Compiègne was one such town, and Joan would set out with a company of volunteers to relieve the town, which was under siege. However, she would have to disband the majority of her army, because it was too difficult for the surrounding countryside to support them. Joan and her army would attack the Burgundian camp northeast of the town, but the assault failed and Joan was captured. She was quickly taken to Beauvoir Castle, where she jumped from the window of a tower, attempting to escape. She was injured, but miraculously survived. The English hated Joan, as she was the religious figurehead of the French army. They would go as far as paying the Burgundians for Joan's ransom, resulting in her trial. Joan found herself standing trial for heresy in the year 1431. The accusations against her were grave. She was charged with blasphemy for wearing men's clothing, accused of heeding demonic visions, and condemned for refusing to subject her actions and words to the authority of the church, asserting that she would only answer to God. During the proceedings, Joan defended herself by asserting that her visions had divinely ordained her to vanquish the English and crown Charles. Her undeniable successes were cited as proof that she was indeed an instrument of God's will. It was understood that if Joan's claims went unchallenged, they would effectively discredit the English claim to rule France. Moreover, her testimony posed as a threat to the established order. Joan's trial thus carried immense political implications, underscoring the gravity of the accusations levelled against her. Joan did not learn the charges against her until much later in the course of her interrogations. The procedures followed during her trial fell far below the standards and fairness expected in inquisitorial proceedings. She endured the prolonged interrogations without the presence of legal counsel, further adding to the injustice of her situation. Joan faced charges of sorcery and heresy. During the final session of her trial, Joan faced inquiries concerning her banner. The inquisitors suggested that the banner may have been the source of her victories in battle, but Joan unequivocally attributed her successes to God alone. She informed her interrogators that the saints Margaret and Catherine had guided her to the banner, conveying it was divinely provided. In the questioning, Joan was asked about her alleged contact with fairies, her habit of looking at her ring before battle, and the presence of the banner during the Dauphin's coronation. These inquiries marked a shift on the focus of accusations, veering more towards the suggestion of Joan's involvement with witchcraft. 
Joan was given an ultimatum to immediately face the flames of execution or sign a document renouncing her visions and pledging to cease wearing soldier's attire. Confronted with the imminent threat of death, she made the decision to abandon her military garb and sign the document. However, just four days later, Joan began wearing men's clothing once more and admitted to hearing voices again. She was accused of relapsing into heresy and was sentenced to be executed. On the 30th of May, in the year 1431, Joan was burned at the stake. From a religious perspective, many view Joan of Arc as a deeply devout and inspired individual, chosen by God to fulfill a specific mission. Her unwavering faith, her claims of divine guidance from saints, and her courage on the battlefield are often cited as evidence of her divine calling. She was canonized as a saint by the Catholic Church in the year 1920, which further solidified the belief in her divine mission for many. However, some theories suggest that she may have experienced conditions such as schizophrenia, which could have led to hallucinations and hearing voices. Joan of Arc's time was deeply religious, and visions and revelations were not uncommon, often regarded as signs of divine communication. Ultimately, Joan of Arc's legacy is multifaceted. She continues to be a symbol of courage, faith, and resilience, regardless of the underlying nature of her experiences. Whether one interprets her as a madwoman, a visionary, or a divine messenger, her impact on history and her enduring influence on culture and faith cannot be denied. I hope you all enjoyed the video. If you did, make sure to like, subscribe and share, and I'll see you all soon for another History Profile.